Hello and welcome to Build a Drone. So this is going to be an in-depth look on how to buy, build, set up and fly a hobby FPV quadcopter from start to finish and the kind of mistakes that can be made along the way. I should start off by saying that the word drone has become a very generalised term by the media, which can be confusing because there are cheap toy drones that stabilise themselves and require some skill to fly. They sometimes have cameras and sometimes not. Then there are the really expensive DJI autonomous drones that basically fly themselves and require no skill whatsoever other than a smartphone. And in my opinion, the most drone-like thing you could build yourself would be a plane. Then there's actual drones used by the military which can be flown autonomously anywhere in the world for surveillance and war. But the one I'm building is an FPV hobby multi-rotor which requires skill, knowledge and patience. They can be stabilised to some extent and even have GPS functions, but we are mainly interested in flying them completely manually, which is where the skill is required. If you really want to get into it, then the best thing you can do is buy yourself a simulator like Velocidrone or Liftoff, along with a controller like the Radiomaster TX16S, and you will learn how to fly and save yourself a lot of money because you can crash as many times as you like. You can also get Curry Kitten's Free Flight Simulator if you don't want to buy one, but the Radiomaster TX16S will work for your simulator. It just plugs directly into your computer via a USB lead and it will also work for your quadcopter when you are ready to build it. Just make sure that you buy the Mode 2 version of the TX16S or any transmitter that you are wanting to buy. FPV quadcopters are either used for racing or FPV freestyle and cinematography. They fly by having four motors which slow up and speed down, giving them similar flight characteristics to a helicopter. But because we have four motors and propellers rather than two, there is much more resolution than a helicopter, so the flight is incredibly smooth in comparison, making it arguably the best platform for a camera. And the four motors are controlled by an onboard computer known as a flight controller which converts your inputs into actions, but at the same time the flight controller reacts very quickly to the forces felt by the model itself, which is very appealing because it means they can fly in almost any weather condition, whereas a plane would struggle. That's not to say that planes aren't good camera platforms, they just aren't as smooth in bad weather. So FPV quadcopters have a camera presenting a live view to the pilot as if they were sat on board the model themselves, usually through a pair of goggles similar to VR goggles, and they transmit on the 5.8 GHz band, similar to most Wi-Fi routers, because this band doesn't interfere with the controller of the model, which is usually on 2.4 GHz. Now there are other variations of bands which are used, but I will cover them at a later date. Now this live feed can be either analog or digital. Analog is a standard definition broadcast similar to how TV used to be. So you can get breakup in the picture when you fly behind objects, also known as snow, which does look a little bit outdated. But on the plus side, the delay or latency between what the quadcopter sees and what you see through the video feed is the lowest. It's also been around longer than digital and therefore it can be cheaper, but also as expensive, which is why people argue about it. And digital is a high definition broadcast in 720p, but because of that, the latency is slightly higher due to the extra processing needed. The cost to entry is higher, and the way the picture breaks up is different than analog if you aren't used to it. Now, in my experience, I can't tell the difference between analog and digital when it comes to delay or latency, but people with quick reactions tell me that they can, making analog a better option for racing. Latency or delay is bad because when we control our quadcopter, we want our inputs to be instantly seen through our video feed, otherwise you can end up crashing before having the opportunity to avoid crashing. 
There's also an unfortunate stigma when it comes to digital FPV because DJI make the most popular HD digital FPV system and many people see them as the enemy of the hobby because they also make the autonomous drones that anyone can seemingly fly and cause a load of trouble, creating the need for regulations to be put in place, making it harder for hobbyists to fly. So some people won't even buy into the DJI FPV system on principle which I think is a huge misjudgment. My take on it is that it's not DJI's fault. They are innovators with amazing technology, and if the media didn't ignorantly use the word drone for everything that has four rotors, then there wouldn't be a problem. It's kind of like saying someone who grabs an Uber is in the same category as a Formula One driver, which is ridiculous. But anyway, when I mentioned to my followers that I was going to be doing this in-depth build, the response for an analog build was overwhelming compared to digital. So that's what I'm going to do, at least initially. Now, quite often you will see a quadcopter with two cameras, and that's usually because we want a high definition recording of our flight, which the live analog feed can't provide. So the majority of analog recordings are done by the DVR built into the receiving FPV goggles, meaning that the video breakup is also recorded. However, you will still see people with a digital FPV setup using two cameras as well. And this is either because the digital FPV camera is in a place that gets the props and shot, which we don't want for cinematography, or it's because these days a GoPro has its own built-in stabilization software called Hypersmooth, which acts a little bit like a mechanical gimbal, but it's done inside the camera and makes the recorded footage look much smoother than can be seen from an FPV camera. GoPros can also record in a higher resolution than the digital FPV system as well. But unlike analog, there is an option to record on board with the DJI Air Unit system. So you will sometimes see a single camera being used and you will also see an analog setup with a single camera because some people aren't bothered about recording their footage in HD and just want to fly. But there are also some cameras that can do both usually called hybrid or split cameras, that can record HD footage while providing an analog out feed at the same time. But these cameras usually suffer with a poor analog video FPV feed, and they also have added latency at the same time for the extra processing that's required. And they also don't have built-in video stabilization like GoPros. So how do we control the quadcopter? Well, you need a controller like the RadioMaster TX16S that I mentioned earlier, where you can use that with your simulator, or you can get a really cheap drone as well and just crash it a lot. But the TX16S has a built-in module that lets you bind to almost any model or receiver on the 2.4 gigahertz band. Now, binding is similar to when you bind or pair a Bluetooth device to your phone. So it allows the controller to talk to the receiver on the model, which then sends your control input puts to the flight controller and it converts that to the motors and controls the model. I'll be explaining in more depth how all of this fits together when building one, but as you can see just describing how a quadcopter works sounds like there's a lot to it. And while that might be the case, it's really rewarding and a fun hobby to learn and understand how it all works. Now, it's very easy and often cheaper these days to buy a ready-built quadcopter, also known as a Bynum Fly or BNF, which already comes with a receiver to bind to a controller that you already own. But then there are plug and flies or plug and plays, shortened to PNF and PMP, which require you to add your own receiver and controller to them. People also call them ARTFs, which stand for almost ready to fly. So there are, unfortunately, a lot of acronyms in this hobby. 
But if you do go down that route of buying a ready-built quadcopter, having never built one from scratch yourself, then if something breaks or a setting is wrong, it can completely derail your experience. I see it so many times when somebody has bought a ready-to-fly quadcopter and they say, this rubbish thing won't arm or I can't get it to fly. And if you are in that position, you might want to watch a video like this. And my rule is, that you should always assume that you are the problem. It's very rare that I actually have a problem with a component. It's usually a setting that I've missed. And if you have that mentality, you will go far in this hobby. So building one from scratch is really important, in my opinion, when it comes to sustaining your interest in this hobby. I think that's where a lot of people get lost. So join me next when I talk about what things you should consider when buying the components for your own quadcopter. Cheers.